like NJ, who read the reports to anyone but himself, I report to 18 governments, so I have to be more diplomatic. <laughs> Excellency, the High Gangop, President of the Republic of Namibia, Your Excellency, the First Lady, Excellency Baba Olusegun Obasanjo, Excellencies, Ministers, Distinguished Ladies and Gentlemen. I think I should, uh, Excellency Emmanuel Ibe Kachiku, you are in this audience, I must recognize you. Two people played a key role in my career, and they are here. Chief Olusegun Obasanjo, I can't thank you enough for recognizing me as far back as 1999 and giving me the first political appointment and not only giving me the position, but asking me to go and do the right thing. And that has informed virtually everything I've done between 1999 and today. <clears throat> Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, when I stood here to speak last year, I spoke on the imperative of a new paradigm shift in the search for solutions to the imminent challenges that the global energy transition posed to the underdeveloped countries, particularly in Africa. I had observed that even though the world had come to accept a global paradigm shift in energy sourcing, especially since the Paris Climate Agreement of 2015, and that paradigm shift has grow, thrown up new challenges, particularly to non-industrialized, underdeveloped countries in Africa, the search for solutions to the identified challenges has not been intellectually rigorous. I noted the contradictions in accepting the reality of energy transition and the challenges that come with it on the one hand, and on the other hand, the search for solutions to those challenges using the same old tools used in the pre-paradigm shift era. Since then, we have had COP27 in upper member country Egypt, where one of its achievements is the progress made in getting those countries that over the last 150 years, by their selfish economic activities, got the planet Earth which is a common patrimony of all the peoples, animals, and plants living on it to the Im imminent climate catastrophe that we are told the planet faces. If all of us, those who did the emissions, as well as the bystanders, do not collectively act fast to end or drastically reduce emissions to agree to establish a climate fund for loss and damage. Ladies and gentlemen, I say selfish economic activities decidedly because today's industrialized countries did not stumble on the knowledge of the dangers of burning fossil fuels to the atmosphere in the last 50 years. As far back as 1896, a Swedish climate scientist, Svantes Arrhenius, had established a link between carbon dioxide emissions and rising atmospheric temperatures. Before him, an Irish scientist, John Tindall, had in 1859 discovered the greenhouse gas effect, which is the process of atmospheric gas trapping heat down the earth. But because these countries and their leaders were determined to industrialize, to make the living standards of their people better, these studies were carefully hidden away from the public. Now that they have fully industrialized, in fact, they have transformed their economies from reliance on heavy industries to the production of services and artificial intelligence, and Africa is on the verge of industrialization, 
we are being told not to use that reliable, affordable, and accessible energy that played a key role in making the difference between us and them today. Fossil fuels, we are told, is dangerous to humanity. Before Shamar Sheikh, today's champions of energy transition had agreed to establish a climate fund for adaptation and mitigation, where they pledged $100 billion annually. At Shamar Sheikh, responding to pressure for a just energy transition, these countries agreed to establish the Loss and Damage Fund. Sadly, many victims of the actions of the industrialized countries are happy with these developments and are eagerly looking forward to what they could get from these funds. And in anticipation of getting a share of the climate funds, these countries produce and submit NDCs that they know are unachievable in the time frame that they give. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, as we prepare to go to Dubai for COP28, it's important we go with our own agenda, not to continue with the herd mentality that has largely characterized our negotiation process. And I should like to propose as follows. On the climate funds, by whatever name you call it, adaptation, mitigation, loss, or damage, instead of dangling those funds before our poor countries, we suggest that the developed countries, who incidentally are also the ones with the technology, should invest those funds in further developing and deploying CDR technologies. When they have done this over the next 15 to 25 years and have succeeded in removing from the atmosphere just 500 megatons or just 25% of the 2,500 megatons of emissions that was added to the atmosphere in the last 150 years, primarily by the industrialized countries, that will give Africa the opportunity to also industrialize using what is today the most reliable, affordable, and accessible form of energy, the same energy form that developed countries use to get to where they are today. Africa shall not put back 500 megatons before it gets industrialized. Even 50% of that shall suffice, and the world will be better for it. There will be less inequality, and less envy, and more importantly, the atmosphere would be 250 megatons less saturated with emissions. In other words, we are saying that keep your money, but clean up the mess that you created. And in cleaning up this mess, be open to all possibilities. There should be no no-go areas. I, did, I say this because there are other, perhaps better ways to handle the challenge of climate change. But because those, those ways go against certain positions taken by these countries, those options are not even allowed to be discussed. Before our end, I would like to extend our invitation to all African countries to consider becoming members of the Apple family. You need not be oil producing to be a member of the new Apple of our vision. Our vision is to create an integrated energy infrastructure markets across the continent. Even if you do not produce oil and gas, your country can be a transit country where we establish our energy infrastructure. Finally, I urge all countries and institutions inside and outside of Africa that share our vision to end energy poverty on the continent and ensure energy security and industrial development for our people to consider being part of the Africa Energy Bank, which Apple and Africa Afri Exim Bank are 
promoting. Your Excellency Minister Mantashi, Minister Etua, and other ministers of APO, let me want, once again assure you that the assignment you gave us last year, we are working on it. We will not allow the proliferation of so many conferences on the African continent when we don't have the resources to do that. We are working to ensure that we do have what is truly continental energy uh, conference. And I want to assure you, two excellencies, that we are working on this with the responsible people. I want to thank you very much for your kind attention.